going to see how individually addressable full color LEDs are made. You can wire a bunch of them up and change each one to a different color of the rainbow many times per second, creating amazing effects. They're in everything from LED strips to computer keyboards to PC fans to architectural lighting. I'm here at World Semi, which is the first and arguably the most well-known manufacturer of these LEDs. A huge thanks to them for inviting me to their factory. They make over 2 million LEDs per day. So let's dive in and take a look. So why are these LEDs so famous and why were they such a game changer? It's because they're the first smart LEDs. So prior to this, if you wanted to have a bunch of LEDs like this that were lighting up different colors, you had to have a driver chip per LED or per couple LEDs. And it was really complicated and required a lot more wiring and space. These have the driver chip embedded inside them and they only have to have four wires connecting each LED, power, ground, data in, and data out, which makes them really cheap and simple to assemble and allows you to space them a lot closer together. This is the first step in the process and one of the coolest. The LEDs start out as empty packages. So these might look like a finished LED, but all they are is metal and plastic right now. They have an outsourced factory that makes these for them. It's basically a metal frame here. It's nickel with silver plating. On the back side are the four legs that will be soldered down to the PCB uh, once the LED is finished. And then they just overmold plastic on to give it this housing. The first step here is placing all of the silicon, all of the ICs inside the package. This machine right now is placing a control chip that provides all of the smart functionality for the LED. And then we'll see later where they're placing the red, green, and blue LED dies. Over here is what's called the tape and frame. This is the carrier for the sliced silicon wafer that comes from the chip fab. When this is first made, it's a single disc of silicon that goes through the standard IC manufacturing process. That then goes to testing. They individually test each IC on the wafer using really tiny needle probes. Then during that testing process, they mark which ones are good and bad. You can see on here, there are some marked with a black dot. Those are bad. This arm is then skipping those. And I don't know whether it's doing that just by visual recognition or if they fed in a digital map of what was good and bad. Both are possible. This half is the frame that I just showed you with those packages on it. And it's doing two things. It has a little tiny needle that's moving small droplets of glue for where the IC is gonna go. This arm is moving individual chips from the tape and frame to the package. The arm is using a little tiny vacuum needle similar to a pick and place machine that you would see in like circuit board manufacturing. I've made videos about that as well. So if you wanna look, learn more about how pick and place machines work, you can go check that out. I'll place a link down below. Now, why do we use tape and frame? The tape is actually stretchy. So before they slice up the wafer, they place it on the tape they slice it kind of with like a pizza wheel essentially, and then they stretch out the tape. And what that does is it moves each individual die a little ways away from each of its neighbors to make sure that when this arm goes in to pick one up, it doesn't disturb anything around it. This is happening pretty quickly. There are some machines that are going way, way faster. They even have two arms that are picking up dies alternately, but this also needs to be very precise. This is a camera here looking down on those ICs. This camera is looking at the destination. This machine wants to make sure there are ICs where it thinks there should be and that they get placed properly and that it actually properly set it down. Next, they put carriers full of panels in ovens like this one and bake them for about two hours at 170 degrees Celsius to cure the glue that's holding down the ICs and the LEDs. Over the entire process, they'll go in these ovens five more times to cure any glue or epoxy that they put on the LED. Next, let's go take a look at the machines that are placing the red, green, and blue LED dies. Now this machine is placing the red LEDs. Same exact setup, just different dies. They are much, much smaller than those, which is saying a lot because those were really small. 
You can see here, this is the die. So this is from the tape and frame, and this is the destination. And the dot of blue is actually bigger than the LED die itself. So this here is the actual LED. I believe this white circle is where they're gonna bond a wire on top. We'll see that in one of the later steps. And down here, it's placing blue and green LED dies. Again, same machine, but you can see here, this is the control IC. This is the red one, this is the blue one, and then this here is the green one. And I believe in between each of these steps, they're going back to the oven to cure the glue that's holding down each individual IC. They said that this machine can place up to 50,000 pieces per hour. The panels then get loaded in this plasma cleaning machine, which cleans off any excess glue that's been left over from the previous step. It uses a high voltage arc similar to lightning to generate the plasma, which cleans that glue off and prepare it to better receive the adhesive that they're gonna apply next. This is a wire bonding machine and it's gonna hook up all of the wires connecting all of the chips to the LED package itself. So this is that circle on the LED package these big planes here connect to each of the four legs on the outside of the package that get soldered down to the circuit board. This is the control I see, and each of these is the red, green, and blue LEDs. These black things here are the wire bonds. Now, it is important to know exactly how much this is magnified. These wires are 20 microns in diameter. That's one fifth of a human hair. It's 0.02 millimeters. These are made out of a gold and silver alloy. They also do gold. It depends on the customer requirements, they said. The wire bonding machine uses a combination of heat, pressure, and ultrasound to melt the gold wire into a ball here and stick it to the pad wherever it's connecting to. So here it's connecting to bond pads on the IC and on the LEDs and then they're connecting directly to the pads that connect to the legs on the LED itself. Of course, this has to be incredibly precise. So the camera is coming in and looking for each individual pad where it's gonna place a wire bond to make sure that it's perfectly aligned, both on the IC and on the LED dies. But it's also going incredibly fast. I'm blown away by how fast this machine runs. The boss said that this can do 3,000 LEDs an hour and it's 10 wires per LED. That's 30,000 wires per hour and 60,000 bonds. That is incredibly fast. And these machines are running nonstop. Wire bonding is notoriously a finicky thing to get right. And these machines are chugging along. There's one person manning this entire two rows of 20 machines. They use an automatic glue dispenser to dispense a few drops of clear epoxy in every well of every LED. The wire bonds are really fragile, so this protects the wire bonds and the chips from any mechanical damage either during the rest of the manufacturing process or during the life of the LED itself. For the smaller LEDs, they actually add the package later after the wire bonding. So they put the wire bonded panels in an overmolding machine. This is essentially a heat press with a mold. It's got a mold on top and bottom. They put the individual panels in after they've sprayed it with a mold release so nothing sticks. And then they insert the raw material pellets, plastic that will get squirted over the top of the LEDs. This takes about 10 minutes with pressure and temperature. And then they come out in these sets of four with the excess plastic flashing. Most importantly, the plastic has been over molded over the wire bonded LEDs. He then trims these with a knife. And then finally, these finished over molded panels get sent out to another factory to get sliced into the individual LEDs. Next, the panels come up here. He's doing a final inspection on them, making sure there's no obvious defects. There's no bent legs or bent part of the frame, no obvious glue defects. They then get loaded into this machine, which uses this sharp roller here to cut the tabs holding the LEDs in the frame. And then finally, they get put in this vibration sieve that removes any dust or metal shavings before they get shaken down here into a bin of finished LEDs. For the smaller LEDs, they actually send them out to be cut and then she is removing them from the backing. I think it's like a rubberized material. 
inspects them, and then finally is loading them into jars, which look like jam jars. And then she loads the jars in this machine, which rotates them as it blows in compressed air to clean and dry them. This is an automated LED testing machine, and it's quite cool in its design. It uses a bunch of relatively off-the-shelf parts that are used in all sorts of manufacturing lines for small parts like this. They're testing a bunch of different things here. They're testing, one, does the LED turn on at all? Two, does the red, green, and blue LEDs light up? Does the smart chip work correctly, both in terms of turning on the LEDs, but also is it sending the right signal out, which would go to the next LED? Also, they're testing the color accuracy of the LED. Are the red, green, and blue LEDs the right brightness? Are they the right color, et cetera? So let's walk through this step-by-step step and I'll explain what's going on. First, they load the LEDs to be tested into this hopper. It's basically a funnel which feeds down onto this little vibration chute, which periodically turns on and moves the LED into a vibration pot. Now, vibration pots are really cool. They're used to load any kind of small part like this onto a line where we need them to be oriented in a specific way. It's a really clever design. They have essentially a spiral ramp on the inside and a vibration motor. And that vibration motor shakes them in a way that the parts work their way up the ramp. And then usually they're designed in such a way that there are a lot of passive features that any part that's not sitting in the correct orientation will just get knocked back into the center of the pot and we'll get a chance to try again to get into the right orientation. This one also has some active features. It has some light sensors and some air jets that will detect components that are upside down or backwards or sideways and blow them back into the center of the pot. Finally, they get loaded onto this rail here in the right orientation and loaded into the main testing apparatus. So this is like a rotary conveyor belt that spins and has one LED per position. It has a few sensors to make sure that there is an LED where it thinks there is, and then it loads it into a testing jig that comes in and touches all four contacts on the LED and powers it up, sends it data, tells it to turn on as well as measuring the data that's coming out. The testing jig is underneath this black ball. The LED shines up into that. And this is a color sensor. So it's white on the inside, reflecting all the light, and has a color sensor in the top of it. That color sensor measures the frequency of light across the spectrum. So you can see here, this is a graph showing the frequency of light, the wavelength of light along the horizontal axis, and the brightness on the vertical axis. So you can see this peak here is blue, green and red. In addition, they're plotting the color out on this point graph here, and the red dot is where the color for the current LED being tested is sitting. Now, their target is to get everything within this center square, but they will accept anything in this general clump. This clump up here are all rejects. So periodically, you'll see this flash red when one either doesn't turn on or is too far outside the acceptable color. Finally, based on the results of the testing, an air jet blows it into one of these tubes, which go down into these bins below. A worker periodically comes by and empties those bins. The good chips then go on to the next step, which is packaging. This machine tests about 10 LEDs per second and is pretty much automated. Every, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, a worker has to come by and unclog a jam, but it pretty much works on its own. Their success rate right now is about 95.6% and their fail rate's about 4.4%. They did say that they don't throw away the LEDs that they're marking no good. They sell them off at a much reduced price below actually the cost it takes to make them, but they get to recoup some of their costs. Let's go see the next step, which is packaging the LEDs. Now the final step is to load those fully tested LEDs in what's called tape and reel packaging. And this is pretty standard in the industry for any electronic components. They're gonna be placed by a pick and place machine. These sprocket holes are pretty standard. The width of the tape is pretty standard, but the wells here are custom made for this particular part. They're a little bit bigger than the LEDs. The LEDs start again in a hopper that leads into a vibration pot, same as before. They get fed onto a rail. And then the same sort of rotary assembly line holder that's going around. These are suction tips 
So this is a suction line. As the LEDs go around, they're mainly focused on aligning them and making sure they work one last time. So we've got an alignment step here that's got four fingers that are pushing the chip into the center of the suction head. Then another electrical test jig just to make sure that electrically it's working like it's supposed to. But also, I think that step's figuring out whether it's rotated 180 or not. Because when you load these in the tape, you want them to be all facing the same direction so that when they get to the circuit board assembly, the pick and place machine knows which way to place them on the board. I think they are testing with four prongs, on one on each leg, electrically to see which one is data in, which one's data out, which one's power, which one's ground. Then they've got a rejection step. If any don't test electrically, they kick them out into a reject bin. And they actually have something here labeled short. It says zero, so it sounds like they're not getting many rejects. This might be a rejection as well. Then they have a step here that looks like it rotates them. So it's figuring out if it is rotated 180, it spins them around so they're all facing the same way. Then we've got another set of fingers that's aligning them back onto the suction head. And then they have a simple light sensor that just checks, is there a chip still attached to the suction head? Making sure that they're not gonna leave any spaces open on the tape. And then finally it gets placed in one of these wells. That's the bottom of the tape. The top of the tape is here and it's just a clear plastic lat piece of tape that has some heat activated glue on the bottom of it. That gets put over the top. And then this here is a heat stamp that is gluing down the glue on either side of the wells. And then finally it ends up here, fully enclosed in the tape and loaded onto a reel. And this is what will get loaded into the pick and place machine. And finally, the finished reels of 4,500 LEDs are packed in anti-static bags to be sold to customers. A huge thank you to World Semi for letting me look around their factory and show you how all of this works. I'll put a link to their website if you want any more information about their LEDs. But this is not the only factory I'm visiting this trip. One of my next videos is going inside a Chinese CNC factory. We'll see how they go from a customer drawing and raw stock to a finished part. You can watch it right now early on Nebula. I'll put a link down in the description. But today's sponsor is an even more impressive machining operation. Prior to the pandemic, they were a family owned aerospace machine shop that built parts for the International Space Station and the Mars Rover, among other things. But when business slowed down during the pandemic, they looked around to see if there was a product they could apply their high-end machining expertise to. Now, I love nothing better than a clean, close shave, which is why I'm thrilled to have Henson Shaving as the sponsor of this video. Okay, I, <laughs> I'm not fully clean shaven, but I have been using the Henson Shaving Razor for the past month or two to shave my neck, and I love it. I'll admit I was a bit reluctant to have Henson Shaving as a sponsor. What's a guy with a, a slightly unkempt beard who hasn't shaved in years doing promoting a razor. I used to just take my beard trimmer to my neck and call it a day, but then I actually tried their razor and holy crap does it give a nice shave. It feels great in my hand, the knurling is crisp, and it has a good heft to it. I actually look forward to shaving. And the secret to it giving such a great shave is Henson's background in precise engineering and machining. The entire length of the blade is supported and held super securely with very fine tolerances. It sticks out only 1.3 thousandths of an inch or 33 microns for you metric folks. That's less than half the width of a human hair. Cartridge razors aren't supported all the way across the blades, which leads to skipping and jumping across the skin, what they call chatter, leading to a worse shave. Now, this razor costs more than a plastic razor you'd get in the store. And that's because Henson believes in being honest with its customers. Most razor companies sell you the razors for cheap and then they charge you through the nose for the blades. They're banking on you only thinking about the upfront cost and not thinking about the cost of owning their razor over time. Henson believes in charging you what things should cost, a fair price for the razor, which is built to last you a lifetime, and then charging you way less for the blades. They only cost 10 cents each, and each one will last you three to five shaves. A box of 100 should last you at least a year, which means it's much less expensive than either a cartridge or an electric razor. And if you need another reason to try out a Henson shaving razor, they use zero plastic. There's no plastic in the razor, the blades, or any of the packaging. The blades are 100% steel and can be recycled, so you're going easy on the environment as well. So if you haven't tried it yet, I can highly recommend them. I love mine, and it's turned me back into a man who shaves every morning. And I'm planning on buying a few more for family. I think they'll make great Christmas presents. So go to hensonshaving.com strangeparts, find a razor you like, 
add 100 pack of blades and enter the code strange parts at checkout and you'll get the blades for free. I've put a link down in the description. Thanks again to Henson Shaving for sponsoring this video. And lastly, I'd like to give a big thanks to JLC for introducing me to World Semi and for flying me out to China this trip. World Semi is a supplier of LCSC.com, which is JLC's electronics components e-commerce site. And it's a great place to buy any of the LEDs you saw today. I'll see you again soon.